trying to get her hip straightened out. I lift up Graham and Lindsay as they are going through treatment for disease. I, I lift up this morning um, Sean and Savannah who, who had the motorcycle accident and Sean lost his leg. Father, I, I ask that he needs his hemoglobin raised up. When, when his hemoglobin gets high enough, they will be able to release him to physical therapy. And that is the family's prayer that they have asked us to pray for this morning, is that his hemoglobin will raise up. So Father, we lay Shane and Savannah at the foot of the cross and all the medical team that's taking care of them. And, and that, that physical therapy will start soon and, and it will be so very successful um, that this, this nightmare will soon be behind them. Father, we, we thank you for this season of Lent to give us time to pause and to reflect and to repent. And so that, that is what we are doing. We are reflecting on, on our nature as Methodist. And in that reflecting, we would like to turn 180 and repent and totally walk away from our sins. Father, I ask that you be with, with those that cannot be with us this morning. And during this time, Father, we lift up prayers that can only be spoken between us and you for this moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now as children of God, we join together in the great prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, as forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God as the Lord comes forward. And as you give your gift to the kingdom, give a gift to a neighbor, and say hello, and um, just this is your moment to talk in church. You have permission. <laughs>
In your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Can you pray with me and for me? <clears throat> Lord, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The incarnation. That is one of those churchy words you have heard all of your life. And sometimes you can just let it slide by a lifetime without ever really understanding what you are saying or what the preacher is talking about because you hear it and you say it so much, especially at Christmas. I hope you noticed we sang a Christmas carol this morning about our incarnate God. And then one day somebody comes up to you asking for your story and they say, what does it mean when you say Jesus the incarnate? And you may or may not have the answer for that question. What well, is simple, and I hope you know I just said that tongue in cheek, incarnation refers literally to the enfleshing of the eternal Son of God. Jesus putting on our flesh, our skin. Jesus coming down with our blood pumping through his veins. Jesus becoming fully human. The doctrine of the incarnation is real simple. It's the same as the doctrine of Jesus. They're one and the same. This doctrine claims that the divine, eternal, second person of the Trinity took on humanity in the human person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. A helpful way to always remember the key characteristics of incarnation is to remember the summary statement of the scripture I read this morning that I know you all know by heart. The Word became flesh. Who does not know that? Our founder, John Wesley, he didn't look on the birth of Christ as just another important event in history or in Christian history. When Wesley looked and talked and thought about the incarnation of Christ, he thought about the divine becoming human. And when I say that's a hard thing to wrap your head around, it is. And John Wesley was way smarter than me, and so to know that he had a hard time with it made me feel a little bit better. But, but John Wesley will tell you that, that he wraps this whole doctrine up out of the words of John, uh, chapter 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming to the world. And he was coming to the world with the gift of prevenient grace. And if you've been a Methodist for two minutes, you've heard the word prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is a big deal in the Methodist church. And we'll be talking more about that later. But prevenient grace can, can be inexplicably linked to God's work in directing his love down towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because I just don't know how you can love someone that much. But you remember the words from Romans 5, while we were yet sinners. He didn't wait for us to get good enough, and I think that's important for us to remember. He didn't wait for us to get on his level. He just did what he had to do. Wesley believed that Christ's incarnation was for the purposes of accomplishing the plan that had been set out at the very beginning of creation, providing a way for salvation to destroy the works of Satan in this world. You see, God always had a plan, and Wesley 100% understood this. Now, it took Wesley a little while to get there. If you do any reading and studying on Wesley, you know he wasn't just hatched from the womb, a 100% believer. But his mama was a great inspiration. I, I, I think sometimes more of Susanna Wesley than I do with John. Uh, I don't know how she did what she did with nine children, but, but she did. Um, and, and, and John and Charles are wonderful products of Susanna's faith. But God continued to create. And just like parents, just think about this. We all probably know someone. Parents that 
intentionally make the choice to adopt a special needs child. And they know all the challenges that lay ahead of them with this child. What could be, what might be, what will be. God, just like those parents, God adopted us. Knowing full well that the tree of the cross was going to follow the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He took us with our brokenness and he adopted us into his family. In his perfect and beautiful and original plan, his will was that we would choose holiness. But we know we chose the trees. The incarnate God now, now that we picked that apple, the incarnate God is no longer an option. That might have been a plan B, C, or D at one time, but now it's no longer an option. I've told you a million times from this pulpit how much God loves us, how He is a promise-keeping God, how He wants each and every one of us to abide with Him in, in glory forever and ever, how we are His mission people and we are all sent out to the world to tell the world about Him. We are the kingdom builders. So why did this happy, perfect, trying God that was loving life and, and loving us and, and enjoying our friendship, why did he make a decision one day that I think I'm just going to take the second head of the Trinity and put flesh on him? Well, as I told you last week, God did create this beautiful world, and he created us in his image. And in the process of creating us in his image, we also got the free will of God. And, and we used that free will part of God's image to disobey. And so instead of responding with thankfulness for the glorious creation that he gave to us, we responded with an ungrateful disobedience. And then just like that, because our disobedience, our perfect, beautiful, loving relationship with our God now look like death. But our divine and our perfect God had a divine and a perfect plan. Through a series of promises and marvelous works, God set about re recreating a people called Israel. A people who would know God and would have a relationship with Him. We have all either read or heard enough Old Testament stories to know that broken relationships and broken people are brought back into connection with God again over and over and over again. God never gave up. In His covenant with Noah, God picked a righteous man to care for this new garden of Eden that he was about to make after he flooded the world. And then he promised to, to humanity that he would never, ever destroy his creation by water again. And in his covenant with Abraham, God picked a man for whom he was going to create a nation. Abraham would have a son and his children would dwell in the promised land one day. And in his covenant with Moses, God chose a man to tell these Israelites how to live as God's people. It took them 40 years of walking around in the desert to get it. But they would not simply be a nation, but they were going to be a holy nation. So God took his time with them and gave them 40 years to figure it out. With David, God chose a humble shepherd boy to establish a king eternal over Israel. I hope, I hope this rehashing of Vacation Bible School, I hope you're seeing a pattern here. Perfect promises made to an imperfect people. But God never stopped. Through the promises and through the brokenness, God creates and he keeps creating damaged people and broken people and faulty people. A lot of us faulty special needs people. He just keeps on pumping us out. And he wants to keep us around forever. Remember that story in Genesis 
when Jacob laid his head on a rock and he went to sleep that night and he had this weird dream about angels. And, and the angels were great and all. And make, it makes beautiful paintings about the angels uh, sitting, flying up and down the ladder. You, you remember that? But, but what I want you to know is as beautiful and wonderful as those angels are, in my opinion, in my humble, this is not anybody else's, but in my opinion, those angels were not the most outstanding subject of that verse or of that painting that we see so many places. At least, and, and, and by the way, I don't think that the angels were flying up and down that ladder. Uh, it, it, at least, that's not what I hear in what's recorded. Listen, and he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on earth. The top of it reaching to the heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. It doesn't say anything about them climbing up and down the ladder. But there was a promise made at the foot of this ladder. This is where God promised Jacob that he would fulfill, he, Jacob, would fulfill the promise that he, God, had made to his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac through him. Through Jacob. The ladder. The ladder, I think, is the key image in this verse. It's the connection from heaven to earth. In John 1 51, Jesus describes himself as this ladder. Have you ever noticed that? That ladder that stretched all the way up to heaven. And came all the way back down to earth. Jesus says this. Very truly I tell you. That you will see heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending. On the son of man. There's the ladder. Jesus was that ladder. He was the, the ladder in Genesis. He was the ladder that we met in the gospels. In fact if you think about it. That, that dream that Jacob had. That's the first hint that we get in, in the Bible that Jesus is going to be the answer to all these promises God was making in the Bible. Way back in the Old Testament, God was making promises and God was keeping promises. He tried so many ways to bridge in heaven and earth, but we just keep picking those apples off the tree. Right? So, God put some skin on the promise. And the angels ascended and descended from heaven to earth on that ladder with skin on it. Our Son of God. You see, before, Jesus was all the way up there at the top of that ladder in the heavens. And we were down here on earth at the bottom of that ladder. But with the virgin birth and held by the Holy Spirit, he lowered himself all the way to heaven to ground floor level to be with us with skin on. In the first chapter of Luke, we read, The angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One will be born and will be called the Son of God. The term incarnate is not actually in the Bible. I did find the Greek word for uh, with flesh, but in all of my studies the past couple of weeks, I have not been able to find the word incarnate in the Bible. But we do get phrases like this that we got in John. And the word of Christ became flesh. That's incarnate. That's incarnate. And lived among us. And we got to see his glory. And the glory of the one and only Son walked around with us and taught us and loved us and took care of us. Full of grace and truth. When Jesus came, he fulfilled the purpose of all those Old Testament covenants that God had made by establishing a new covenant. With Jesus, the pattern of the covenants are completed. He is everything that Noah and Abraham and Moses and David were but more. He is a new father to many nations, blessing the whole earth. He is the holy high priest who puts us directly in connection with God. We do not have to call a priest 
to pray for us. We are directly connected because of that ladder uh, that the angels are ascending and descending on. He is the everlasting king. He is our savior to the whole human race. The pattern was established in the Old Testament when Jesus completed it in the New Testament. And when Jesus came down to our level and, and became uh, God in the bond, yes, I was thinking about the mod squad when I read that, but he, he bestowed great honor to humanity when he came down here in body, in flesh. Now, I want you to think about this. Imagine getting an invitation from your favorite American president, living or dead, this is your imagination, this is your dream, and then you get to go to the White House for dinner with this great person. D.C., like it or not, suddenly just became a little more special than that hill up there where a lot of politicians live, right? Something like that happened in Concord, North Carolina one time on April 18, 1865, but in reverse. The Confederate President Jefferson Davis rode through Concord and spent the night one night. He spent the night in a little white house on the edge of town, sort of like Darius's house up there across the street. His is blue, but this one was white. It was a little white house, just like all the other little white houses in Concord. And the family, they used that white house in the 1800s as a boarding house. They took in people off the street and they served them meals. This was before the Hotel Concord was built. And all of us growing up in Concord, even a hundred years later, we always called that little house the White House. Partially because the Southern President spent the night in it, but mostly because the family that owned it's last name was White. So to this day, there, there are people, if you go to Concord and find the right person, and if you ask them where the White House is, they'll say, oh, it's where the library used to sit, but progress was made and it's gone now. But the memory of that special visit that night in April is etched in iron in downtown Concord. It's on a historical marker so that all of us grandmas can tell our grandchildren this is where the president slept one night because that was special. And we felt special. I'm sure they all felt special in 1865, having the president spend the night in Concord. Or the day that we got invited to the White House by our favorite president that's just in our head only. You know, we can kind of lose our minds and go crazy when we're in the presence of legends, right? I mean, this family here was in the presence of a legend a few weeks ago and couldn't wait to get it all over Facebook and watch the preacher lose her mind because she didn't get invited to the event. But, but, you know, we just kind of do lose our stuff when we're in the presence of a legend. But we know there's more to the story than that, right? It, it, our story is, is, is where the Son of God became a man. And all these humans are protected by the power of this king. Like we were protected by the power of Jefferson Davis for a while. We were protected by the power of whatever president you imagined in your mind. We like people that protect us, that take care of us. And, and the message, John Peterson's, the message translation, translates 1 John 1.14, the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I just love that. Somebody will see that on Facebook one day because I just love that, that, uh, that translation. And, 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 and I could just kind of hear, um, uh, uh, what, what's his name? You can't touch that. Uh, hammer, hammer, yeah. You know, I can just hear hear Howard looking at Jesus and saying, you just can't touch that. And, and, and anyway, I, I feel like that power and protection that Jesus brought to earth is kind of like living in my neighborhood when I was growing up. All of my neighbors, and if any of them were still living, they would tell you, and some of their children are living, and they will tell you, they all felt safe because there was a six foot, six 
tall, extremely handsome man living at 37 Smith Street that drove a police car. And when he was out and about, he kept check on his neighbors 24-7. And that handsome man just happened to be my daddy. And it was very comforting having him come home every night. You see, it's, it's like Jesus down here on the ground floor living with us now. We know that there's no enemy, not even the last great enemy of death, can ever do harm to us. Like, I, I, when I was with my daddy, I never worried about anything. And, and, and I'm sorry for everybody that did not have a daddy that made them feel that safe and protected. But I did. And, and not just me and my family, he made the whole neighborhood feel that way. And I just think that this human man who I know all of his faults, I could tell you horrible stories about my daddy that I'm not proud of. But I think about if God could use a man like that to make so many people feel safe, how could we not feel safe in the arms of Jesus? I hope that that maybe makes your heart feel more than just a little strangely warm. I hope that when you think about Jesus moving into the neighborhood that, and, and, and what it took to get him here, promises that were broken, promises that were trying to become, until it finally became the incarnate one. And that was the promise that ended all promises. So much divinity wrapped up in skin. You see, the main point here is that the Son, he had to be united in a fully human nature. He had to stub his toes. He had to step on rocks. He had to skin his knees. He had to get a cold. He had to have headaches. He had to understand what we were going to be going through. So he became fully human while being fully God. And that's the part that Leslie and I both wrestle with. How can you be fully human and fully God? And that's where your faith says, I don't know, but God says it, so it's got to be true. Because our whole person, each and every one of us that are listening to my voice right now, our whole person, our body, our mind, our soul, are broken because of mortal sins that we commit way too many times. So Jesus Christ, he had to become just like us. He had to be true human. Jesus is the David and the Moses and the Abraham, but so much more. He rules over all his people as the perfect king. David was never a perfect king. He empowers all of us for holiness through the Spirit. This is what we are moving towards as Methodists, is holiness to be more like Jesus. And, and Jesus offers us these blessings under this new covenant of his blood. We are a true family, all with special needs, all with our own faults, all with our own broken fingers. But we're also filled with the spirit and the love of God. And I believe that everything in this entire book here, I, 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 I just believe that everything in here is leading us up and pointing us to this goal to bring God's people back together again. I, I just think when, when Jesus left us and said, God will tell everybody about me, it wasn't for us to go as much as for us to bring people to God. So I believe that all of these covenants, all of these promises, all of the brokenness, it is all for one purpose and one goal. That we will go out and we will make disciples. That we will go out and we will tell our true love story. We will go out and explain to people this is not a club. You don't get a membership card. This is a family. It's a family that, that we, that, that of broken people uh, with mental challenges that, that cannot make great decisions. But God adopted us anyway, knowing what was ahead of him. Because God put skin on him, and he got in the game, and he dwelt among us. Friends, this door is unlocked. Jesus 
is the mother or the father or the grandmother that's sitting and waiting up for a good night kiss before you go to bed after being out all night. And he will always keep that light on. And he will wait as long as it takes to get his special needs children all together again. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you are able, would you please stand for our hymn of invitation on 598?